But the thing that smacks everybody over the head is that when people get a pneumonia with it, they're very sick and a lot of them are ending up in the intensive care unit and dying. And it's the vast majority of the deaths, like I said, 19 out of 20, have died because of this acute respiratory distress syndrome. That is not a pneumonia. It's like a pneumonia on steroids. And it's, it's, um, it's not part, my, this is what I'm saying, it's not part of the normal course of things. Were it not for the modern diet, we would not be seeing this pneumonia on steroids called ARDS, and we wouldn't have so many people dying. Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. Well, hello there. How are you in these crazy, crazy times? I hope that you are doing amazingly, staying healthy, happy, exercising, getting in the sun, and staying sane amidst all of the craziness. As you know, there are many controversial things which I talk about on all of my social media, but this is not the time for that. This is the time for podcasting and an amazing conversation with my friend, Dr. Kate Shanahan. I have a new book out. It is called The Carnivore Code. I hope that you will check it out. If you have not yet, it is thecarnivorecodebook.com. It is available on ebook and print. I know Amazon is taking a long time to get it to people, but you can get the ebook if the print book is taking too long. Both Dr. Kate Shanahan and I agree that diet is everything. And Dr. Kate Shanahan has an amazing new book out too called The Fat Burn Fix, which we talk about in this episode, which is super cool. So, Dr. Kate is pretty amazing. She is a board-certified family physician. She works with the Los Angeles Lakers. She is the author of Deep Nutrition, which is an amazing book that, as I talk about with her in this podcast, I found out about when I was in medical school and is a very parallel book to many of the things that I have been thinking about, how our ancestors ate and how that might inform how we eat today. Fat Burn Fix is her newest book and is about why some people have trouble losing fat and the insidious things present in our diet, specifically processed sugars and more importantly, vegetable oils, which we go into great detail in this podcast about are hampering normal metabolic health and even more relevant to today's coronavirus conversations is the fact that vegetable oils are certainly changing the composition of our cell membranes and could easily be contributing to worsened outcomes with coronavirus disease, COVID-19, in those intubated, in those experiencing ARDS, or what appears to be some some variant of ARDS, acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome. Some have noted that perhaps those intubated look a little bit more like high-altitude pulmonary edema, which is also known as HAPE, H-A-P-E, but regardless, both HAPE, HAPE is really a subset of ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which acts, Dr. Kate and I discuss in this podcast, is essentially pneumonia on steroids, an immune reaction gone haywire in the lungs. If you listen to the previous podcast I've done on coronavirus, you know that the immune response is toned, is very tightly controlled by insulin, and that insulin resistance is critical, is a critical player in a negative way in an overactive immune response if the innate immune system is disordered. So listen to the previous podcast I did with Stephen Hussey. Listen to the podcast I did three weeks ago, a solo cast on coronavirus, if you want more information there. In this podcast, Dr. Kate and I go into details about how the fatty acids in our diet, the composition of the fatty acids in our diet is critical for proper membrane function and, again, how that could be a real driver of lung injury, poor outcomes in coronavirus, and a contributor to insulin resistance, which I believe is the driver of so many chronic diseases. All right, you guys. So check out Dr. Kate's new book, The Fat Burn Fix. And check out The Carnivore Code. If you like this podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes. It is how we get the word out to more people. If you appreciate this message, share it with your friends and family and those who you feel may benefit. As always, I appreciate all of the sponsors to this podcast. In these crazy times, places like White Oak Pastures, the sixth generation farm, which has been in the Harris family, Will and Jenny Harris, 
have are uh, the leaders of this farm now, but they have had 150 years in the Harris family of white oak pastures. For the last 20 plus years, it has been a regenerative farm, which means that on that farm, they are doing practices which mimic ecosystems grazing of ruminant animals like buffalo, deer, and elk, etc. on the plains, which eat grass and then move to a new pasture of land and then move back to the old grass. And by moving off the land, they allow the land to regenerate. By pooping and peeing on the land, they return organic matter to the land. They increase the soil mycorrhizal networks, that is the fungal network, in the soil with the plant roots, which allows more carbon to be sequestered in the soil. More carbon in the soil means richer root systems, means more nutritive plants for animals, means better quality food for us and animals which live healthier, happier lives. So they are cared for in the best way possible, and they provide us with very nutritive food, and we are so grateful for that cycle of life as always. White Oak Pastures is leading the way in regenerative agriculture in this type of carbon-negative agriculture, enriching the soil with carbon increases the carrying capacity of the soil also for water and prevents runoff and erosion. So check out whiteoakpastures.com. They have amazing grass-fed, grass-finished lamb, beef, uh, turkey, guinea, chicken, all kinds of amazing stuff. They have eggs. Their ribeyes are out of this world. You will find what you like there. They have organ meats too, but that is a secret because I love their organ meats as well. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD at whiteoakpastures.com to get 10% off your first order, and they are working overtime to get us all amazing meat. If the grocery store is sold out or you don't want to go to the grocery store, this is the answer. I love the people at White Oak Pastures very dearly, and they are doing good work, and they are very good people, and supporting them is good for everyone. It is a vote with your dollars for the goodness, the good people. Good people. Another set of good people are my men and women at my brothers and sisters at ancestralsupplements.com. As you know, they are putting back in what the modern world has left out. They are producing grass-fed, grass-finished organ complex supplements sourced from New Zealand, the beautiful lands of New Zealand, conveniently encapsulated into a gelatin capsule, which means that you and I and all the people you know, brothers and sisters, children's, can get the nourishment of organ meats without having to eat organ meats directly. They are low temperature dehydrated, which is desiccation. And that preserves so many of the nutrients in these foods and allows us to eat things like liver, bone marrow, heart, thymus, lung, spleen, heart. I mentioned heart twice. That's because it's so good. Eye. They have an eye supplement. They have a testicle supplement. It's called MOFO. It's amazing for men and women, hormonal balancing. The glandulars are so amazing, and as you know, if there are two things I believe in, they are regenerative agriculture and nose-to-tail nourishment for humans. So if we can support farms that are doing it the right way, grass-fed, grass-finishing, the farms in New Zealand, white oak pastures, and ancestral supplements, helping us get these organ meats that many of us don't have access to or are not used to eating in this convenient gelatin capsule, it is a win-win-win-win-win. It's not just a win-win. It's a win-win-win-win-win. It's multiple winning. It's winning all day. They're amazing. I provide them for my family. I have a two-year-old niece who is the apple of my eye. She is the cutest thing. And a father and a mother who are 70 years old. And I want them to be as healthy as possible in the midst of all phases of their life, especially now with coronavirus. And so my mom and dad are ordering food from White Oak Pastures, and they are taking supplements from Ancestral Supplements because I believe in these two things so deeply. So check out ancestralsupplements.com. Recently, thymus and lung have been particularly popular from them. They are putting back in what the modern world has left out. You can use the code SALADINOMD at their Shopify site for 10% off your order. Okay, you guys, on to the podcast. Listen after the podcast for what is going on with me. My goodness, this is a good one. Enjoy. All right, we are live. Dr. Kate Shanahan, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Dr. Saladino. <laughs> we'll just call each other Kate and Paul on this okay. podcast. <laughs> it's good to connect with you. You know, I've been a fan of your work for a long time. When I was in medical school, I did a lot of study in integrative medicine. I went to the University of Arizona and worked with Andrew Weil and a bunch of the folks there. Cool. And I remember one of the books on the bookshelf was Deep Nutrition. And you've got a new book, wow. The Fat Burn Fix. We're going to talk about both today. But I pulled Deep Nutrition off the shelf and I was like, this is cool. And sort of this traditional <laughs> awesome. lifestyle, this ancestral living idea that you talked about in that book, we'll elaborate more on the podcast, 
captivated me many years ago. So you've been, <laughs> you've been occupying this little part in the back of my brain for a long time. So it's good to finally connect with you. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I mean, I'm, I really admire the things that you've been doing with your patients in turn and bringing this whole conversation around inflammation kind of to the forefront, the way that you do and, and inflammation itself alleviating symptoms and uh, alleviating inflammation, I mean, in ways that people thought you would have to get a lot of weight loss around to accomplish. So I, I just, I love that. That's awesome. That's really cool. So I think that, you know, when this podcast comes out, which will be the beginning of April, it's, you know, we're recording it a few days before it's going to be released. There's so much talk about coronavirus right now. So I want to, I want to talk about coronavirus because so many of the things that we are going to talk about in this podcast are relevant. And what's so interesting for me is that in my history as a physician, I've always rebelled against specialties in medicine. And I think the same thing is true with this coronavirus idea that you can't just say this is an infectious disease. What we know is that this is an infectious disease that is affected by your metabolic health. And that, we were talking before the podcast offline about how important this is. And I'm encouraged that I see some people beginning to talk about this in the mainstream media, but I wanna really emphasize this conversation. And I, I think you would agree, we can't put organ systems into boxes in the human body. There's no such thing as a siloed way of doing medicine. We can't say this guy's an immunologist and this guy's an infectious disease specialist because what coronavirus is showing us very clearly is that guess what? An infectious disease specialist also has to be an endocrinologist, also has to be a cardiologist, also has to be a rheumatologist, and also has to be and somebody that understands diet and inflammation. And this right. is the problem with mainstream medicine. So uh -huh. Let's just start there. I mean, what is your perspective on who is getting sick with coronavirus and what can the epidemiology from your perspective tell us about this? I think that the reason coronavirus is so um, terrifying is that we have this um, idea that healthy people are ending up in the ICU from it. Um, and what's happening is actually not particularly different than what happens with a flu every year. It's just that there's a little bit more of it. And, um, and, it's, and this virus has a little bit greater tendency to end up in the lungs. Um, so the virus, there's a lot of really cool stuff that we've come to understand extremely fast about this coronavirus, this uh, COVID-19, also called SARS-2. Um, it's, a, it's a derivation of a cold virus. So corona, colds are coronaviruses. And so just that alone is like, okay, so why is this one unique? What makes this one worse than a cold? Well, two things. Um, really one thing actually. So the cold virus does what this virus does. And it, it attaches to receptors in the back of your throat and your upper airways and gets into your throat cells and causes a little bit of a sore throat or a scratchy throat, or if it more gets into your upper airways, like your nose, it'll cause more nasal congestion and post-nasal drainage. It can even get into your uh, conjunctival membranes around your eyes and cause some itchy eye. Um, and if that's the only thing it could do, is get into those types of cells, it would be no different than every other cold. But one thing it does that makes it different is it's able to get into a certain type of receptor called an ACE, an, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor, and those exist in the lungs. So it can get into your lungs and cause pneumonia. And so it's very rare that a cold can cause a pneumonia. The flu, actually, on the other hand, does this every year. When people get a really bad flu, if they get a bad cough of it with it and a shortness of breath, then they're having a pneumonia. The flu has gotten into their lungs too. Um, but the only way that this virus has been killing people, or the main way, like um, you know, for every 19 people uh, that have, or I'm sorry, for 20 people that have died with this, about 19 have had this one condition called ARDS, which stands for acute respiratory distress syndrome and kind of tells you the whole story right in the name. Acute means it comes on, you know, in, in a matter of days or weeks instead of months or years. Respiratory, your lungs, distress, oh God, syndrome, and there's other stuff going on. So, um, so, so the COVID, if everybody were metabolically healthy, I'm saying that, COVID-19 
would only be killing very old people the way the flu does or very young people the way the flu does. Now, interestingly, this hasn't been, it didn't bother young, most young children were not getting it. And the thinking is that this particular type of receptor, that this particular virus gets into the lung cells, maybe doesn't, maybe children don't have a lot of it in their lungs just yet. So it doesn't seem like children are getting sick with it until they're like four or, you know, in their teens or something. We're just coming to understand some of this more detailed stuff about these nuances of this virus. But the thing that smacks everybody over the head is that when people get a pneumonia with it, they're very sick and a lot of them are ending up in the intensive care unit and dying. And it's the vast majority of the deaths, like I said, 19 out of 20 have died because of this acute respiratory distress syndrome. That is not a pneumonia. It's like a pneumonia on steroids. And it's, it's, um, it's not part, my, this is what I'm saying, it's not part of the normal course of things. Were it not for the modern diet, we would not be seeing this pneumonia on steroids called ARDS, and we wouldn't have so many people dying. We'd still have the elderly dying just because, you know, your lungs are sort of, when you're in your 80s and 90s, and if you've been a smoker, um, or, you know, just being old, the lungs are not as healthy or robust and able to handle any kind of infection. And so, you know, it, it can be fatal to have any kind of pneumonia when you're over some thresholds. It used to be 80. They keep pulling it back as we get less and less healthy. Now it's like in 60. Um, but so what's happening with this COVID-19 is that it was very clear early on that people with underlying conditions were the ones who were ending up in the intensive care unit because they had this acute respiratory distress syndrome. And the underlying conditions were immediately identified as um, kind of a random collection of metabolic diseases. So, so you had your diabetes, you had your hypertension, gout was up there, you had uh, morbid obesity, and um, you know a couple other things, uh, history of cancer, that was another thing. Um, but uh, oh, oh, wait, was there another one? immune suppression for any reason, like so if you're on immune suppressive medications because you have... Um, you know, for example, like lupus or something, um, then uh, again, those are the people that were ending up in the intensive care unit and with that ARDS. But what's happened, and this is causing like the, the mass hysteria and a lot of confusion is why are these seemingly healthy people ending up with this problem? And um, they've been showing pictures, like the, the first one that showed up on my Twitter thread was a kind of a very attractive, very young, probably late 20s um, African-American woman. And the picture of her that I think was probably in her obituary or something was, you know, she was gorgeous, but she was obviously overweight. But the headline was, you know, this healthy young woman succumbed. And so the first thought is, okay, she's beautiful, but she is, let's not overlook the fact that she's overweight. So we can't call that healthy just because it's so common now. And, and then um, the next one that came across my Twitter feed was a bodybuilder, another African-American who probably had a body fat percentage of like less than 10%, bulky dude, also in the intensive care unit. Uh, he wasn't, he unfortunately hasn't, hadn't died at that point in time. I don't think he has, but they're saying, no, he's, this guy's healthy. And I'm saying, no, he's not. I'm saying he probably has at least pre-diabetes. And the reason that his doctors aren't aware of that is because he wasn't aware of it, for one thing, because nine out of 10 people with pre-diabetes, which is the condition that um, means you're on your way to developing diabetes, um, nine out of 10 people are not told by their doctor that they have it. So if they don't know, how would the people treating them know? And you might be like, well, can't they see that their blood sugars are high? Yes, but how often do you pay attention to a slightly high blood sugar in an intensive care unit critical care situation when the person doesn't have a history of diabetes? Exactly. Right. I mean, I, I don't think ever, I, you know, I haven't been in the intensive care unit probably in a lot longer than you haven't, but I, I remember it was just sort of bleeped over. Well, yeah, I love it. You're <laughs> highlighting so many important things. And this, I think this is the, one of the most poignant parts of the coronavirus conversation is 
who is susceptible? Should we be fearful? Is the pandemic, you know, real? Apparently, a lot of people are getting sick, but who should be fearful? Should healthy people like you and I be, be fearful? What does healthy really mean? And I love that we're go. talking about this right up front in the podcast because I am of the same mind as you. I think that generally speaking, within Western medicine, we are really myopic when it comes to understanding what true metabolic health is. My sad knowledge, my sad realization is that most physicians are not checking fasting insulin. They're not checking C-peptide. They're often not checking hemoglobin A1C or even a fasting glucose that often on people who are not morbidly obese or having already diagnosed frank diabetes. So I think a lot of people who the media is portraying as healthy may in fact have metabolic syndrome. And if that is the case, then we have a super valuable piece of information that we can move forward with, with yes. regard to future treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Because the other piece of this equation is that this virus is probably not going anywhere. Uh, I've heard people talk about, um, infectious disease specialists talk about the fact that coronaviruses and influenza are transmitted year round in tropical climates. This may be with us through the summer and into the fall, it's not a matter of avoiding the coronavirus and hiding out until it evaporates in the summer. I don't think that's going to happen. I think most of us are going to be exposed. And the true conversation is, who are these 19 out of 20 people that are getting ARDS? And I want to dig into those in a little more detail. But on my Instagram and Twitter feed, I posted a video of an ICU doctor. I believe he was in New York or Pennsylvania saying that in his ICU, there were 15 patients on ventilators and 14 of them had diabetes or prediabetes. And the last one was a 94 year old man who they had not tested for this. So in his ICU, 90 plus percent, you know, 93, 94% of people had prediabetes or diabetes. And as you mentioned, within the United States, 40% of people are diagnosed as obese. We don't see obesity as unhealthy, which is just crazy. And I think this is something that you highlight in both of your books that, hey, look, this is your metabolism. The metabolism of humans is a vital sign that we've just forgotten about. So this is sort of one of these extra vital signs that nobody ever checks. You check your blood pressure, check your pulse, check your temperature. What's the other vital sign that you and I both are interested in? How, how well is your metabolic engine running? So super interesting stuff. I also just want to highlight for people. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just want, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. There isn't even a specialist for metabolic health. Right. <laughs> it, it, this is something that everyone talks about. My metabolism wor isn't working right. Um, it, it, you know, I, I feel like my metabolism is slowed down. We don't even have a doctor, a group of doctors who, who have taken responsibility for that. So there isn't anybody to, to uh, among the medical community to stand up and say, hey guys, listen to this. It's only folks like us who are, who come across as like, self-taught or self-appointed experts in this area. So it's hard for us to break through to the medical community. And I think this is the problem with medical specialties, that there's a balkanization, there's a siloing of specialties. There's an endocrinologist and a rheumatologist and a cardiologist, and nobody knows whose patient it is because somebody has to take ownership. And then somebody says like, well, nobody owns, there's no like mitochondrial specialist. I mean, which is the problem with medicine and the problem with the way we are teaching physicians that if you think about things in terms of specialties, you're going, to, you're going to have blinders on. It's too myopic. You can't solve disease. That was something I realized very early on in my training. And we all do residencies. Some of them are specialty residencies. Some of, those, some of them are more general, broad residencies. But we all do residencies, and we're all encouraged to, to choose a box and to think within your box. You know, When I was a PA in cardiology, they used to say, just think here. Think in the heart box. And I was like, what are you talking about? And <laughs> this is the problem now is that there's no communication. There's no metabolic specialist. I think we need, we need a specialty in medicine or we just need to do away with specialties in medicine beyond proceduralists and just, call, just make sure doctors understand inflammology. But that's a whole separate right. discussion. Right? <laughs> and I just want to clarify for the listener a couple of things about pneumonia and then and ARDS, and then we can go into those. So pneumonia was a confusing concept for me in medical school. People hear this term, and I love that you highlighted why this coronavirus, this common cold made into something different, is killing so many people. And it is, it's getting into the lungs. It's binding to this angiotensin II receptor, 
on the type two pneumocytes and it's causing pneumonia. Well, what is pneumonia? People think pneumonia is bacteria in the lungs or infection in the lungs and technically it's not. It's just the movement of immune cells into the lungs. It's an immunologic reaction in the lungs. At least that's how I think about it. And then ARDS is when there's just a flood of immune cells and basically rampant inflammation and scarring and the alveoli, these little sacs in the lungs where the gas exchange happens, get filled up with fluid and debris and cells. So like you said, pneumonia on steroids is ARDS. Pneumonia and ARDS are probably on a continuum and it's the movement of immune cells into uh, the, the alveoli in the lungs. And then if that just happens everywhere, you get what people are describing as a whiteout on a CT scan. And that's ARDS, this acute respiratory distress syndrome. Is that how you would think about pneumonia? How would you describe pneumonia to someone and contrast it with ARDS just so that the listener can understand this? So uh, I see it as, um, so I, I like what you said about the movement of immune cells into uh, the, the lungs. Um, uh, I actually thought, and you know, this is doctors don't always agree. Maybe we don't always all learn the same things. Maybe we're, you know, I actually thought it was an infection that you had to have some kind of infectious foreign living agent living in your lungs. But, um, but cool. So you've taught, you've taught me something. Um, but the way, so the way I, um, distinguish it is, um, given your definition, uh, so let's say, uh, let's say there's something that causes an immune reaction to occur in the lungs. Um, the difference between pneumonia and ARDS is, uh, effectiveness and, um, futility. So, uh, when you have a pneumonia, that immune reaction is effective it because it's just dealing with whatever the problem was. Um, so let's say it were an infection that's killing the bacteria or it's killing the viruses or it's killing whatever else could be in there. That's causing it, perhaps some foreign uh, substances that you would inhale. But, um, the, um, ARDS is a, reaction that has that is no longer serving a purpose it's gone out of control and so what we're talking about what it causes is um an inability for the lungs to do their job it's basically lung failure so your lungs are exchange membranes uh between the air and your bloodstream and what they're exchanging is oxygen they want oxygen to come in and carbon dioxide to get out and they do this through an extremely thin like as thin as it could possibly be membrane um, called the alveoli. And if that thing is thickened by anything, then your ability to exchange air is reduced. And so when you have a healthy lung, let's say it's like breathing through like a one layer of a, like a cotton shirt, right? So I can breathe, it's pretty fine. You know, I, there's plenty of air being exchanged. Imagine though that I had more than one t-shirt. It's gonna be harder to breathe. And what, when you look on um, a microscope section of somebody who died from ARDS and compare it to a normal lung, the thickness of that um, exchange membrane, the alveoli, is like 10 times, 20 times, 50 times in some people who die um, in some different parts of the lung. So imagine trying to breathe through 50, a pile of 50 shirts. You're not going to. That's why they die. Um, and so the, the severity of ARDS, I think, directly correlates to how thick the, that membrane becomes. And what's it filling up with? Well, it's filling up with gunk, dead cells, um, fluid, and, and most of the fluid is derived from an inflammatory response, like the kind of inflammatory response that you have when you've been bit by a bee and you swell up, or if you, you sprain your ankle and it swells up, there's fluid coming into there. Fluid that came was in your bloodstream and now is in a separate area and it's where it's not really supposed to be. And it serves no purpose in ARDS. In pneumonia, the immune response is serving a purpose. It's trying to get rid of whatever the thing is there. But in ARDS, the the system is broken and there's, the reaction is out of control. It's kind of like peanut allergies. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a, a crazy response to a tiny little bit of peanut that can be deadly. So ARDS is a crazy response to an infection in your lungs or even just an infection anywhere in your body. People with uh, bad infections elsewhere can get ARDS and die. 
Um, they don't always die, but it has a high mortality rate. Um, and, um, and so that inflammatory response is really the focus of the, where the focus of the conversation should be right now in this country if we had metabolic specialists. Because what I'm saying is that a normal, healthy inflammatory response doesn't cause ARDS with this particular virus. Um, and that those people who have ended up in the intensive care unit um, with ARDS and who have died from it uh, had an out of control inflammatory response. And when we poke at it with these so-called underlying conditions, I'll tell you what the real one underlying condition that unites them all is, and that is that their body fat has too much polyunsaturated fatty acids from a lifetime of eating seed oils and it concentrates in their fatty acids and in their body fat and these fatty acids have a very damaging effect on our lungs they damage the rest of our body too they cause hypertension they cause diabetes i think they even play a huge role in causing cancer they are the problem they cause insulin resistance and insulin resistance i think everybody who studies it would agree is kind of the what we consider the common soil of many 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 if not most metabolic diseases insulin resistance is a precursor to um, pre-diabetes, which is a precursor to diabetes. But what's at the root of insulin resistance in experimental animals, animals, they do this all the time. They give them a high fat diet. It's a high fat diet induced insulin resistance. Now the dietitians pick this up and say, oh, fat causes insulin resistance. But look at the fat that they're feeding these animals. Exactly. Corn oil or some other vegetable oil or seed oil high in these kind of fatty acids called polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are very important to understand. And I dive down into it in my book. I just have to, I have it sitting next to me. So I'm just going to love it. it. Show <laughs> it. Fat burn fix. I love it. <laughs> so, so that's what, that's what like, um, you know, my frustration is with this, this epidemic is that we, we feel like we have no control because it, we, we have this idea that it's striking healthy people, you know, like it's like lightning. It strikes without warning. No, these are people who, if you look at their last fasting blood sugar, I'm sure it's high. If you look at their last triglyceride level, I'm sure it's high. Their last HDL is probably low, or if not, you know, all of those things, at least one of them because if you have none of these markers of metabolic disease um that your doctor does i you mentioned a few that are that are super important and and very sensitive i use much blunter tools and and diagnose it because you know we're just we, we've created uh we get people who are test who are testing their cholesterol levels every year they get their blood sugar tests every year and the doctors look at the numbers and and they don't understand that what they're seeing are abnormal numbers because we, again, we, we have lowered the bar on health. We have raised the normal fasting blood sugar level. When I first graduated medical school, the normal ranges were of fasting blood sugar was 65 to 85. Wow. Now it's 70 to 90 or a hundred even in some, depending on what lab you're going to look at. So yeah, wow. that's it's because different. the average has moved and the same, you know, different conversation around the fats and the lipid levels, but the people who are at risk have metabolic disease and they can, they're, they, they can go back and look at their blood levels and know whether or not they're at higher risk. And the good news is you can improve that. You can improve that now before this academic, academic epidemic is over by just starting to eat healthier starting tomorrow. There's, it's not going to you know, fix all your metabolic problems overnight, but you can stop doing the things that are putting you at higher risk, which you didn't know you were doing. I love it. And I will definitely get into that, what people can do, action steps. That's been the thing that I have hoped to advance in many of my social media outlets and conversations now around coronavirus is how can we protect ourselves? How can we protect our parents? Many people who listen to this podcast and who follow me on social media are pretty fit and may not be susceptible, 
but we all know people in our lives who are not as healthy as they should be or could be. And so how can we help them do this? And I, it gives us power. It gives, it empowers us to understand, like you said, this is not lightning. This is not a poisonous spider that's waiting in the grass to get you that you can't control. And you just absolutely, you just accidentally step on sometimes it's, it's, this is totally, or there is a real conversation that this may be preventable, that we can absolutely modify our baseline risk. We can't prevent uh, exposure to coronavirus beyond what we're doing in our lives. This is the social distancing and the hand washing. We can't prevent maybe getting SARS-CoV-2 or developing some form of the viral infection, but we can affect how our body responds to that. And I love that you're highlighting all these pieces and that's about the immune system. And I love that you highlighted that pneumonia um, is this, this you know, immunologic reaction to something in the lungs. And uh, just to be clear, I was saying that it doesn't have to be bacteria, it can be viruses. And I think we might even be able to get sterile pneumonia, but that's a whole separate conversation. <laughs> but but when, it, when the immune system goes out of control and we get this cytokine storm, that's when you get the ARDS. And as you said, you don't even need to have an infection in your lung to get ARDS. It's a cytokine storm in the human body. It's when the immune system goes haywire why is the immune system going haywire? One reason, I think that, you know, so much of what we're talking about now is, is all connected. Again, this is the theme of my work and your work that we can't think about things in terms of medical specialties. It's all connected. Our metabolism, our metabolic health affects our immune system. Absolutely. I did a podcast on coronavirus two weeks ago or three weeks ago, and this podcast is going to come out. And I talked about a paper showing that insulin signaling at the level of the T cell is crucial for T cell maturation, for proper T cell signaling. And if we become insulin resistant, then insulin isn't going to be able to signal at the level of the T cell, at the level of our, you know, our muscles, at the level of our liver, at the level of our brain, anywhere in the human body, at the level of our eyes, because of this underlying um, sort of pathology going on within the cell, whereby they're not saying, I'm not listening to you insulin. So it's the majority of the cells in the body. And I love that you point this out. A lot of times, this is related to metabolic dysfunction. And for a lot of people, it could start with too much of these polyunsaturated fatty acids. This is something I talk about in my book as well. Where does insulin come from? And this insulin resistance being behind so many pathologies. So the $64,000 question becomes, where does insulin resistance come from? So walk us through this from your perspective. How do these vegetable oils lead to insulin resistance? Very simple. So you eat them. And they are high in these kinds of fatty acids called polyunsaturated fatty acids. Those are important fatty acids to understand. Um, they're different from saturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids. How? They're chemically different. Um, they're less stable. They're so much less stable that you can see it on your counter. When you take out your butter, it doesn't melt on your counter. When you take if, uh, olive oil, that's got more unsaturated fatty acids and that's why it's liquid. When you put olive oil in the fridge, parts of it turn solid because olive oil has some saturated fat in it. When you put corn oil in the fridge, it stays liquid because it has very little saturated fat. And you can also feel the difference too. Um, uh, you can feel this instability. So you can see it and you can feel it. So it looks solid instead of liquid and it, it, it's, it changes over time. The polyunsaturated fatty acids change over time when they react with oxygen. You can tell that if you've ever had a bottle of corn oil over a month or two, the edge of it, you know, where the screw cap is, gets very, very sticky, very <laughs> tacky. Um, whereas butter, you know, you can have butter that's been in your fridge for a month, although not usually if you're following the kind of diet that we recommend, right? But that butter is not going to change even if it's exposed to air, it's still going to stay the same, which is kind of slippery and slimy. Um, so because it's stable, so it's, it's got a lot more stable saturated fatty acids. In it. So this instability means that our body can't just do anything with it. We, we, we can only tolerate a very tiny amount in our body tissue. Most of our body tissue um, highly regulates the different kinds of fatty acids that we have, because if the recipe were wrong, then our cells would be either too stiff or too liquidy. It would be like the Goldilocks scenario and, and um, you know, everybody's the cells would die. They'd be either too stiff, too hot or too cold. They wouldn't be just right. So we need this certain amount of little bit of polyunsaturated fatty acids. How much? Maybe like, um, 
uh, two to 3%, right? Just on your Joe average cell. There's different cells have different amounts. But if you get more than that, what happens? Well, you have to store it or burn it. But if you have too much to burn that moment after that last meal, you're going to store it. You're going to store it where? In your body fat. And over years, it actually builds up in our body fat like a toxin um, would build up. So a baby is born with body fat that has more of a normal human body fat profile. But over years of eating uh, these vegetable oils, the concentration of the polyunsaturated fatty acids rises and it gets to a certain threshold where you get into different kinds of metabolic problems. And this is reflected in something um, surgical. <laughs> So you can take a biopsy of your body fat and analyze it and see how many polyunsaturated fatty acids do you actually have. And they did this 100 years ago or at the turn of the, like early in the 19 teens. And they saw that at that point in time, the, the percentage uh, was somewhere around 2 to 3%, maybe some up outliers were up at 5% at the most, but it was really 2 to 3%. As the century wore on, and the amount of vegetable oil being consumed went up, the percentage of polyunsaturated fatty acids in body fat and human body fat went up too, right along with it. So by the middle of the century, instead of being two to 3%, it was around 10%. And now we have people where it's around 20 to 25% in the last like a uh, bit of research I could, I could get was from biopsies done in 2010. And since it reflects, since the body fat reflects the PUFA in the diet and our PUFA in the diet has gone up significantly since 2010, I would predict you will find people in the population that have 30% of their body fat now composed of these unstable polyunsaturated fatty acids. That's the difference. That's why somebody who might have 10% body fat can end up in inflammatory trouble because that when that body fat gets released, you can't burn your body fat in your fat. It has to get released and it gets released into your bloodstream. Then it goes to your muscles and they burn it. Well, that when that body fat is unstable and your cells try to burn it, it damages the mitochondria. And that's very important. So what are mitochondria? Well, your listeners probably mostly know, but mitochondria are the little energy factories of the cell. They burn, um, break down products of sugar. They can burn anything. They, that's where every calorie you've ever burned has gotten burned because it's oxygen combining with these other molecules and generating cellular energy called ATP. And when you give mitochondria or you give a cell uh, pure polyunsaturated fatty acid to burn and no other fat source, it will shut down that mitochondria within a matter of minutes. It, it happens, it's a, it's a mitochondrial defense. It actually literally kind of blows a fuse. Mitochondria have fuses, it's kind of cool. Um, they're called uncoupling proteins. And um, it activates, burning these polyunsaturated fatty acids activates the uncoupling proteins and the mitochondrial production goes from 100% of baseline down to, you know, 10% in the case of an omega-3 um, on a polyunsaturated fatty acid, which are the most unstable kinds of fatty acids at the threshold of concentration that was studied in the, in the study that I cite in my book numerous times. It's like the most important study ever done because it proves that these polyunsaturated fatty acids cause mitochondrial damage, the mitochondrial damage that causes cells, and this is the connection to diabetes, causes cells to need sugar because they can't burn fat right? Yet when the body fat is being delivered and it's got this high concentration of PUFA, they're not getting energy. So the cells with their mitochondria about to be shut down or have shut down already, they desperately suck in more sugar. They need a fuel. Sugar's always in the bloodstream. So they suck in more sugar. So when you suddenly have more cells sucking in more sugar, what's going to happen to your blood sugar level? Go down. It's gonna go down. How are you going to feel? Pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> yes. And hypoglycemia is the thing that everybody gets before mm -hmm. they get prediabetes mm -hmm. and they ignore it. 
because they tell their doctor about it and their doctor says, oh, don't worry about it. Just have something to eat, have a snack. Have right. just more sugar, more snacks. Right. So what's happening is that person is in the process of developing diabetes and their doctor tells them just eat more sugar to regulate your blood sugar, which makes the problem worse because the problem is your body fat is dysfunctional because it's full of these PUFAs. So I know I just gobbled you go to a whole lot of science and I said it was going to be simple, but I mean, the theory is it's simple. Your cells can't burn fat. So they request an alternative fuel, namely sugar. Your, your body's need for sugar goes up. What happens then is is here's where you go from hypoglycemia to actually having high blood sugar. Your brain, your brain is smart. It says, hey, I'm not getting enough energy here. Well, your brain has the ability to regulate your blood sugar by something called the vagus nerve. It tells the liver, the vagus nerve tells the liver, release more sugar. The liver does it, obliges. Now, when that happens, your blood sugar goes up and your pancreas says, wait a minute, there's too much blood sugar here. I'm going to push out more insulin. So you get hyperinsulinemia. So you have the brain and the pancreas fighting each other for control of your blood sugar level. How long can you be healthy when your two organs are fighting each other for something so major? I mean, not long, right? <laughs> Stupid question. So, <laughs> so, so what happens though is the brain wins the battle because the brain is hardwired, it has the nerve, the vagus nerve has more power to determine what the liver's doing than uh, the pancreas with just producing insulin, which the liver actually becomes insensitive to. So there you go, that's insulin resistance, that's how PUFAs cause insulin resistance, which is the precursor to prediabetes and diabetes. But you're already in metabolic trouble when you have insulin resistance. And the, the cause, like you said, the $64 million question um, is that how, what's doing it? Is it carbs? And I say no. I say, sure, once you've developed uh, hyperglycemia and insulin resistance, having carbs is going to be a bigger problem now for you than it would for somebody with a healthy metabolism because you're going to have to produce even more insulin, which is going to make you build more fat and going to make you more, you know, all the problems that you're, I'm sure you've talked ad nauseum, right? About how insulin, you know, overshoots and you get hypoglycemia, makes you hungry and tired, makes you build your body fat. You can't release your body fat. Basically it puts you more into another meta, whole another metabolic problem. You had one metabolic problem. Um, at, whereas your body fat is too high in PUFAs. And then when you are uh, insulin resistant and producing and eating carbohydrates all the time. Now you're constantly hyper, super hyperinsulinemic, and you have now you have a whole other set of metabolic problems. But the underlying problem behind your hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance was these polyunsaturated fatty acids. And I completely, yeah, I completely agree with you. And and most of my audience will know if they've listened to the previous podcast that I am not someone that vilifies carbohydrates in and of themselves. There's some nuance around the type of carbohydrates and how they're processed. But as I talk about in my book, um, there, there's some nuance in terms of the consumption of carbohydrates and fat together and overfeeding studies, which we can get into. But I'll just try and summarize what you said for the listener because it's so <laughs> important to emphasize this point. So what we're talking about here are fatty acids. And my listeners are all super sharp. They've heard me talk about this before and the carbon chains that make up fatty acids. And the number of double bonds between the carbons are what determine how unsaturated a fatty acid is. And so a saturated fatty acid has no double bonds. It's all single bonds between the carbons, which means that it's a straight molecule. It lays flat and so it can pack more uh, efficiently together and they stay more solid at room temperature. Every time we put a double bond between carbons, we get a kink in the structure and the actual, you know, you can see this in organic chemistry textbooks and something anyone that's interested in biology has learned that the more double bonds you put between the carbons, the more kinks you get and the more bent the fatty acid gets. And that means it can't stack as efficiently and it's going to be more of a liquid at room temperature. It's going to have a, a lower melting point than a saturated fatty acid. So super interesting. And at a molecular level in terms of protecting this, getting into like really geeky, fun organic chemistry, that double bond creates a cloud of electrons around the two carbon molecules that is subject to what's called an electrophilic attack. 
and you can get this lipid peroxidation reaction and the formation of free radicals. People have heard me talk about this in my book. It's the oxidation and reduction of molecules, which is really what runs life. It's the gain and loss <laughs> of electrons. It's all the movement of electrons. So if there's an extra electron or there's an electron in that double bond orbital and another molecule comes along and rips it out, you get an unpaired electron between those two carbons and that is a lipid peroxide. And lipid peroxides generate more free radicals. They do this lipid peroxidation reactions. And the peroxidation of lipids is exactly what happens around the edge of that corn oil bottle when it gets sticky. That's how oils get rancid. The double bonds get electrons stripped away because that's how they oxidize normally in heat, light, and air that they, that they lose those and they become free radicals and they become reactive. And so just as you're saying, evolutionarily, and you talk about this uh, originally in your first book, which is Deep Nutrition and in much more detail in The Fat Burn Fix, we really only got a small amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids in our diet. And these are the PUFAs. So PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acids, doctors and scientists, we love our acronyms. We love our shortening of words. So PUFA is polyunsaturated fatty acid. Sometimes people say MUFA, which is a monounsaturated fatty acid. Nobody ever says SIFA, like a saturated fatty acid. We don't, oh. have a, we don't have an acronym for that. We don't have like a short abbreviation for that one. But evolutionarily, if you look at wild animals, their fat is composed of a small amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So eating wild animals, we would have only gotten 0.5 to 1 or maybe 2% max polyunsaturated fatty acids in our diet. Now, as you alluded to, and I want to clarify this for the listener, both omega-3 and omega-6 are polyunsaturated fatty acids. They both, they have multiple double bonds between carbons across the molecule. Now, the omega has to do with how many carbons from the carboxyl terminus of the fatty acid, the first, the first double bond lies. So in, you know, more simply put, that just means how far from the end of the fatty acid the first double bond is. And omega-3 has a double bond three carbons in, and omega-6 has a double bond six carbons in. But as you said, the omega-3s are actually some of the most unstable molecules because they often have multiple points of unsaturation. So when we're naming fatty acid molecules, and though this may sound totally esoteric and geeky, it's really important that, that we all understand this. We're naming molecules of fat based on the number of carbons and where in the carbon there are these unsaturations, these double bonds between carbons. And regardless of whether we're over-consuming omega-3 or omega-6, too much polyunsaturated fatty acid is going to create an oxidative stress on our bodies. Now, it's very rare that people over-consume omega-3. Most of what we're seeing in our culture is over-consumption of omega-6, specifically linoleic acid. Um, but it, I believe it is possible to overconsume omega-3 as well. And we can talk about that. That's a nuance uh, sort of mm -hmm. down the road. But most of what we're seeing is omega-6 vegetable oils because they're enriched in our food. And I tell my clients this all the time. I tell the people I work with this all the time. When you go to a restaurant, ask what they cook the food in. If you look at a label, look at those labels. You will be amazed at how commonly you will see, let's give people some idea of these vegetable oils corn, soy, sunflower, safflower, peanut, et cetera. These are all polyunsaturated, rich vegetable oils, canola being the most common one that are contributing to this problem. So there's a point in, I think it's deep nutrition. You say that you walked into your office one time and you got a fax from the chief of the CIA. The president of the CIA. The yes, I, of thought, the CIA. I thought okay. I was like, <laughs> I thought I was like, wow, they're really listening to me now. Finally, the <laughs> government's coming after me. So but tell me what was, happened with the president of the CIA really quickly. So I was in Napa Valley, and the CIA means different thing there. It's the Culinary Institute of America. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so the president uh, actually sent me a fax. It was urgent, and he said, please stop terrorizing the public because my husband and I had a regular column called the stock report. It was in the food section. We don't know really much about money management, but we do know about bone stock. And so um, we, we had uh, like a commentary. There was one actually uh, article we had written called the canola blob. 
And in that article, we lamented the fact that at this so-called culinary epicenter of the world, as Napa has dubbed itself, because they do have a lot of restaurants that would be great, um, they use canola oil in the vast majority of their restaurants, which is called it the, or, or another vegetable oil. Um, so we just called it the canola blob. And um, that was not cool for the Culinary Institute of America. Um, for reasons that weren't entirely clear to me, but I suspected they had something to do with sponsorship or, or, or scholarships or something like that. And when I looked it up, indeed, it, they, they're heavily, all their events, uh, they've got like um, Unilever on there and Unilever mm. is, is like, you know, one of the, it's like Cargill, you know, all these Monsanto Dow. And they actually specifically had canola oil because it's supposedly the healthy vegetable oil because it has more omega-3 than omega Six. Um, so anyway, um, a dietitian wrote a, a nasty letter back after that, um, and then we finally said, "Hey, you know, let's let's talk in person because we're not we can't really communicate well through editorials." And so he was very friendly. He said, "Let's sit down. Uh, come up to the Culinary Institute of America, our, our restaurant. Um, we'll take you out to lunch." So my husband Luke, who wrote the deep nutrition book with my with me, and we had uh, the president of the CIA. And we actually had a, a neutral party who was the, um, the, the uh, food and wine editor for the local paper. And um, we started out uh, with an olive oil tasting, right? So, the, you know, they have flights of wine. Well, they, they do the same thing with olive oil at the Culinary Institute of America. We have these beautiful little vials of, of olive oil laid out in front of us. And the gentleman, the president, he was so eloquent in his way of explaining all the efforts that they went through to maintain that olive oil without being oxidized. Like they would literally remove air and have it sit with a neutral gas on there, like argon or something. And um, so that it wouldn't oxidize. And as we were sipping and enjoying the beautiful view and everything I said to him, you know, I was honest, I was honestly really impressed. And I said, I'm really impressed that you are basically, you know, talking pretty high level chemistry here when you're talking about the measures you go through to prevent the olive oil from oxidizing. Why wouldn't you think the same thing might happen to canola oil? And I saw the gears turning and within five seconds, he said, because there isn't enough olive oil to feed the masses. <laughs> so, um, that's where, that's when, so that's when I said, okay, but there's, that's a political problem. What we're talking about, what I'm talking about, I'm a doctor. I'm just trying to square up the science here. And I didn't go so far as to say, so you're comfortable lying to people just to make them buy crap. So there's more olive oil for you, but that's what I really wanted to say. <laughs> uh, because I mean, how dare he? Well, you know, what's funny is I was recently out at a restaurant and I'm just going to, I'm just going to do this. You know, I was recently out at a restaurant and I was with, you know, the founder of Whole30, who's a very nice woman. And, you know, we were at the restaurant and, and I said, do you guys use canola oil in your food? And they said, yeah. And this was a Whole30 approved restaurant. I was there with some friends and, and, and the founder of Whole30, Melissa. And and I said, Melissa, why is canola oil allowed on Whole30? And she said, because people have to be able to go to restaurants. And I said, I got a little, I got a little frustrated. And I said, but it's not any better than any of the other vegetable oils. What makes you think that it's better than corn, soy, peanut, or canola? Or, or you know, or, or any of, well, canola was what I was talking about. But what makes you think that canola is better than corn, corn soy, or peanut? And she didn't really have an answer. And I thought, this is not cool. Like, you know, canola. Well, I don't mean to call anybody out in particular, but restaurants in general will try to push that up there, and they say, "Well, you know, it's it's just as good as olive oil." Oh, really? Well, it's also cheaper. And why is it that a bottle of like uh, mayonnaise or salad dressing will say made with olive oil? And of course, when you turn it around, they mean, okay, there's some olive oil in there, but it, there's also soy. And that's probably the most, the first listed first, there's the meaning there's more of it. Why is it never the other way around if canola oil is so great? Made with canola, but you find olive oil back there. So it's about the dollars. And, and so if people are trying to make this be like, oh, well, we have to feed the world. They're saying poor people deserve to be unhealthy. And I think we really ought to 
stop pretending that that's not what people are saying because how else can you interpret that? Yeah. I don't know how else to interpret that either. Um, <laughs> and, and I, and you know, I, I, for the listener, canola oil is made from rape seeds, right? It's not even made from something that humans really eat. It's blanched and deodorized, highly processed. And canola oil is thought to be quote healthy because it has more alpha linolenic acid in it. As I talk about in my book, and as you've talked about, the human body's really miserable at converting alpha linolenic acid to usable omega-3s, EPA and DHA. So why alpha linolenic acid is something we want to tout in flax oil or canola oil is beyond me, but um, that that's the reason. And this is a maybe a, a good segue to a mini digression. I think that people consider canola oil to be healthy because it lowers LDL. And this is the this is the dangerous thing about vegetable oils. And I'd love to talk about this with you. And I think this will be a really interesting conversation. So many of these vegetable oils will lower LDL, won't they? You can, in, oh, you, yes, can enrich, you can enrich your diet in canola, corn, safflower, or soy, and watch your LDL go down. So what's going on there? I talk about this a little bit in my book, but I'd love to hear your take. So uh, my thought is that what's happening is that the particles are being oxidized and they're not in circulation, so you can't measure them. So, but they're not like politely disappearing. They're actually falling out of circulation and landing on your arteries. So they're actually causing arterial plaque. So that's, that's how I think that this, they lower LDL, they lower it, sure, but they do it by causing exactly what you don't want, which is arterial plaques. Um, and, and I think that uh, the whole idea that LDL really has anything to do with heart attacks, that's a humongous, huge other discussion. But I think part of the confusion fusion or the way that the reason we talk about it in such a silly way is because we talk about cholesterol clogging your arteries, but what really, uh, what really causes fatal heart attacks is fat. And it's the, the, tri, the, the fatty acids that um, are released from your body fat or the triglycerides that have built up in lining in your arteries that are soft and they, um, they are, shouldn't be there and they can actually damage your arteries and make them bleed and cause an immediately fatal heart attack. So that's, uh, you know, the artery actually is so weakened by these inflammatory fats laying on the inner surface that it causes the artery to, to bleed or to leak and you get a clot or the, you can actually have little pieces of this unstable plaque, this soft buttery plaque is how they describe it, um, it, it break off and go downstream and cause small heart attacks or mini heart attacks or small strokes, which we have an epidemic of. They, they talk about how mortality from heart disease, from heart attacks has gone down, but the kind of heart, heart attacks that we have now are dramatically different. We have a, a ton of these mini heart attacks from these little emboli that are happening, and we don't have quite so many of the immediately fatal heart attacks that you can't save because the person's dead by the time they hit the ground because their artery in their heart has bled and clotted and very few people can survive that kind of abrupt change in blood flow and the arrhythmias that follow. So, um, so that's my take on the seed oil, vegetable oil, polyunsaturated fatty acid oil, lowering LDL, why it does absolutely nothing for health or mortality. And, and this, you know, it's, it's, if it does anything, it should make us understand that lowered LDL is really not meaningful. It just doesn't matter. It's more of a reflection of whether or not you're fasting or whether or not you're burning your body fat than anything else. It's a, it's a complex equation. And I, I agree with you mostly there. It's, it's very interesting. There's a study that I've talked about in my book where they decreased the amount of saturated fat that people had in their diet and increased the PUFA they increased the polyunsaturated fat in their diet through vegetable oils like soybean oil. And they saw LDL go down, but LP little a and oxidized LDL go up, suggestive of worsening atherosclerotic progression. LP little a is a, a molecule, is a lipoprotein that looks just like LDL, but has this special lipoprotein little a, like a tail attached. And it's associated with higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. 
I talked about LP Little A in a podcast I did with Malcolm Kendrick previously. It's kind of an unknown. Some people think it might be mopping up oxidized LDL, but LDL is glycated. Yeah. I think I think what it is is the normal LDL particle has an extra abnormal molecule on it because there's been a glycation reaction that's occurred in the bloodstream and basically it just it's like a tag. Now now you have another it's two things stuck together. It shouldn't it shouldn't be there. And the fact that it is means that you have some uncontrolled reactions. I don't think it's something that the body does on purpose, hmm. but I don't really know. That's just my theory. It's a, it's, a, it's a questionable thing. But then just like we talked about fats being oxidized, LDL itself, which is a lipoprotein, so it's like a ball, you know, it has a, it has a lipid bilayer, which is going to have different fats in it, just like we were talking about. And that the LDL molecule can become oxidized and oxidized LDL appears to be problematic for humans as well. So when we're thinking about oxidation of fats, well, if we just, if we looked at the membrane of a cell or we look at the membrane of an LDL lipoprotein, these are composed of phospholipids. They're sort of have a, phos they have like a, a phosphatidylcholine head and these two lipid tails that hang down. And people might've seen this in, um, in, in biology textbook, but those two, two lipids that hang down are formed of fat molecules. And those can be unsaturated fatty acids too, and often they are. And that's when we say our membranes get enriched in certain fatty acids, saturated, mono, and poly. They're in the tails of the phospholipids that make up the membrane. And those same phospholipids make up the membrane of our LDL molecule, our LDL lipoprotein. And so if we eat more omega-6 or too much omega-3 even, then those phospholipids in the membrane can become oxidized by time and, and space and other free radicals that are floating around. And so if we enrich the membranes too much with these potentially unstable fats, then LDL can become oxidized. And is oxidized LDL more damaging to humans or is oxidized LDL the product or something problematic? We're not sure, but what is very clear in the research is that if you put more omega-6, more PUFA into the membrane of your LDL, it will become oxidized more easily. And that is a very bad thing, but the total amount of LDL will go down. And so this to me is such an interesting, just, it just destroys the LDL hypothesis or calls it into deep, deep question that we, like you said, LDL interpreted in a vacuum is really meaningless. It, it, it may have utility and it may have clinical endpoints associated with it, but we have to think about it contextually and realize that just because a vegetable oil makes LDL goes down, does not mean that vegetable oil is doing anything good for us. And it's all about this oxidation and reduction of those fatty acids. We don't want our body to have lots of those in our body. We don't want, we don't want our fat cells to have those. Going back to the mitochondria real quickly, I'll just say something that I thought of earlier and wanted to mention that, that when the mitochondria, you were, you were talking about how when the mitochondria go to process polyunsaturated fatty acids, it kind of breaks the mitochondria. And I think that's, that's totally possible and really interesting. And, um, also, when the mitochondria get overwhelmed with nutrients, they, they, they emit, they sort of put out reactive oxygen species. So the same sorts of signaling molecules, the same sorts of free radicals that can be produced by oxidized lipids are produced by our mitochondria in times of insulin resistance. That's part of the break that the mitochondria use to say, I'm going to become insulin resistant. So it could be happening at two levels. When the mitochondria tries to actually do the machinery to process a polyunsaturated fatty acid, it can break the mitochondria. But also if more of these polyunsaturated fatty acids are getting oxidized in our body, we're having more reactive oxygen species, which could in and of themselves change mitochondrial signaling and cause cells to become insulin resistant. Do you think that's reasonable too? Absolutely. And the analogy that I use to describe it, because I mean, I think that's exactly a lot of what happens, um, is it's kind of like it, your car engine wants to burn a certain type of fuel, right? Because right? it needs to maintain a certain temperature. If you give it the wrong fuel, it will run too hot. It will run too hot and then things will start, to, other things will start to dysfunction. And that's kind of exactly what happens. So the mitochondria have a specific, a specific fuel that they run best on. And when we give it another, when we give them something else, we give them the wrong fuel, they literally run too hot. And that's what this blowing the fuse thing is. And the heat in this analogy are those free radicals. They just start spewing free radicals because they can't control the reaction anymore. And it actually does produce heat. And I think this is something that, um, is another one of those overlooked things. Like earlier, I was talking about like hypoglycemia symptoms we overlook. Well, 
there's a, since I um, started thinking this way, I started uh, noticing that certain a certain group of people say were telling me that when they're active, they feel like they have like a hot flash or a flush, or if they get stressed, they feel that way, or sometimes they just feel extremely hot. Now I used to just blow that off as like, well, you're overweight, you got extra insulation, but I think actually what's really could be happening is that they're feeling this energy doesn't go nowhere, right? I mean, if you blow a fuse and you're still oxidizing stuff, but it's not turning into ATP. So you're still consuming oxygen and at least until that free radical, you know, until that particular mitochondria shuts down, but let, let's say it's happening at a low level. So you're producing less ATP, you're producing more free radicals. The mitochondria is still going, but it's just operating less efficiently. It hasn't totally shut down. So more heat, less energy, well, you're going to feel pretty crappy when you exercise. And there's a lot of people I started asking, how do you feel when you exercise? And they're like, well, I kind of feel horrible at the beginning, but I push through it. And, you know, at some point, yeah, so your circulation gets better, you get better at the heat exchange issue. But I think really what's happened is that we've essentially turned people into inefficient, the PUFAs have turned human beings into more like radiators in a way. Uh, where we are actually generating because of inefficiencies, we are generating more heat and we are less able to generate energy. And that's going to make you feel terrible. You're not going to want to get up and move. And so many other people have told me that, Oh yeah, you know, I used to, before I changed my diet, I used to just drive around. I don't care if it was 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the hot sun in a Walmart parking lot, looking for that close spot. So I didn't have to walk an extra 200 feet. And then when they change their diet, they don't have to, they feel they have plenty of energy. They got energy to burn. And people usually attribute that to um, having lost some weight, but you can feel that way even if you don't lose weight or even if you just lose five pounds. And, and it's because your metabolism is now working better and generating energy. That's what you, we haven't talked too much about metabolism, but there's, that's the one thing that your metabolism is supposed to do. It's supposed to give you energy. That's, you can define metabolism different ways. The, for the purposes of this discussion and for the book, Fat Burn Fix, I define it as those cell processes that generate energy. Everything involved in regulating energy supply in your body and demand and use. And so that includes the hormones that regulate. So it includes the mitochondria, obviously, that generate it. It includes the hormones that regulate your um, body composition and how much energy you're storing in the form of fat and releasing in the form of free fatty acids. It includes um, your body fat itself, right? Does, how much PUFA is in your body fat? If it has too much PUFA, you're, gonna, you're in trouble and your whole system's going to break down. And it includes the appetite regulation centers in your brain, which tell, which are supposed to be sensitive to things like leptin and um, adiponectin and, um, and are supposed to... Um, be sensitive to insulin too. But when you have all this inflammation in your body and in your brain because of high PUFA in your diet and sugar definitely plays a role, um, you are you become insensitive to leptin signal. And so your body literally thinks you're starving when you are weighed down with body fat. It's like it, your fat becomes invisible to your brain. And so it makes you hungry. And it's, a, it's this kind of constant fantasizing about food. I mean, this is very, very um, deep stuff. We can't, you know, if you are starving, the starvation studies that Ansel Keys did before he started doing horrible studies that destroyed the world. Um, <laughs> uh, he did starvation studies and people reported fantasizing about food, having intrusive thoughts about food. Well, how many overweight people could relate to that? How many people who are trying to go on a diet and all of a sudden they're like, I just can't stop thinking about popcorn or cake or whatever. And it's in the office. And how am I going to resist that? That's not your lack of willpower. That is what happens to one of the four fat burn systems. Your, the, the part of your metabolism that's supposed to regulate your body composition thinks you're starving. So you're going to act like a starving person and be obsessed about food. Yeah, I love it. And you did detail all of those in a great way in the book. And the book really lays out for people how changing your diet and changing those fundamental fatty acid ratios in the diet can help with fat loss in a satiety centered way. I've always felt like putting people in prison and making them just calorie restrict was the worst way to lose fat ever. It'll work, but it's a starvation thing. And there are so many people in the health space now 
claiming that it's just all about your macros and it's just all about calorie restriction. And yes, that will work, but that is called starvation. And there are much better ways to lose fat, to lose weight by changing the quality of the foods you eat that don't put you in a jail, right. in a mental prison when you're trying to lose that fat. So thank you for sharing that. I think it's so interesting. So as we start to wrap up here, I was going to ask you, do you ever do red blood cell fatty acid analyses? Because I've been thinking about this a lot in the context of your work. I do this a lot with my clients, like a red blood cell omega level. You can get a red blood cell fatty acid profile. I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to be able to sample some of my fat or some of your fat or some of one of our patients fat and be able to tell them, this is how much saturated, this is how much mono, and this is how much polyunsaturated fat you have in your fat cells. And this is why things might not be working. I do a test similar to that with my clients, a red blood cell fatty acid analysis. And I'm always really intrigued by what it shows. Some of the most interesting things I see are that people on carnivore diets have very low linoleic acid, which I think is probably a very good thing. And you'll see the ranges, omega-3, omega-6. They really just are doing this test to tell you about your omega-3 to 6 ratio, which I think is less important ah, than, right. than many people make it out to be. But you okay. can see how much omega-6 is in the membrane of your red blood cells. And if I see an omega-6 that's high or a linoleic acid that's more than 20% on this omega check test, I think it's too much and I don't want that. And, <clears throat> but in the people I work with who are on carnivore diets, the omega-6 goes way down. The linoleic acid is usually much lower than the reference range even because they're not eating much linoleic acid. Right. There's a little bit in animal fat, but yeah. very small. But do you do anything like that? Are you aware of any analyses like that? Do you use any of those metrics? I would love to do a test called a non-esterified fatty acid profile uh -huh. uh, because that directly reflects what is in your body fat. Um, now it's in the blood. It's a blood test mm -hmm. and it tests. So the way fat travels through our blood, there's two ways. One is the lipoproteins, mm -hmm. which get all the media attention, you know, oh, look at me, I'm an HDL, I'm good. <laughs> well, the, okay, there's a whole other way that fat travels in the blood and that is um, it bound to albumin in the form of free fatty acids. That's what mm -hmm non-esterified means is that are there it's not bound to a triglyceride it's free so it's been it's that's how the um adipose tissue releases fat to be used between meals to be used really for burning right so when it's traveling a lipoprotein it's going to go maybe you know for building blocks of for your tissues and it could be used for anything really but um but for the way the body releases it for burning is in these non-esterified fatty acids and you can actually get it's not cheap a couple hundred bucks a non-esterified fatty acid profile. So you can get um, a total breakdown of all the different fatty acids that are in your bloodstream at any given moment. Um, of course, it has to be fasting. And, um, and, and that's a direct reflection because studies have shown this um, of your adipose tissue concentration. They, they've done the studies that show, you know, okay, well, is biopsying somebody's body fat, that kind of hurts. Um, you can't do that that often, but is there any other test? And this was the best test. It was, it was definitely better than the um, red blood cell membrane phospholipid, which is an unfortunate fact that because, you know, um, Gary Taubes, I'm sure maybe your readers know who he is. Um, he's still struggling to uh, find out why doesn't carbohydrates, why aren't they the main cause of insulin resistance? I mean, that's where he's at because <laughs> he doesn't believe it's the polyunsaturated fatty acids, partly because he was involved in a study that evaluated red blood cell lipoprotein, you know, phospholipid content, and it didn't really correlate. The PUFA content didn't really correlate. The reason is because that's regulated, right? So maybe it's, it's a good marker for the balance of uh, omega-3 to omega-6, just mm -hmm. like you said. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, it's because the body that is also a direct reflection. The body can't do, it can't convert three into six and vice versa. Right. So if the red blood cells doing the best with what it has, even though it's regulated and may want things to be another way, it's still going to be a pretty good reflection of what your dietary omega-3 to omega-6 um, concentration is. But what you really, what I really want to know is how much linoleic acid is there, how much um, of all the omega-6s and all the omega-3s. And so the non-esterified fatty acid profile is the best way to do that. I don't do that because the, the patient population that I work with doesn't have that, you know, 
amount of money to spend because it's not covered by insurance. Um, but I would recommend that anybody who does work with clients that are spending money, like hundreds of dollars on tests, this is a super valuable test to understand what's going on in your body fat. But the good news is, um, you can also just look at a triglyceride to HDL ratio because right. that is a pretty decent uh, proxy for insulin resistance. And, um, and so, you know, you can kind of piece together these things with the, with blood tests that you already have. If you're listening to this and you have access to you, if you've gotten your blood test, by the way, for your audience, maybe they don't know this. Um, you can look at your blood test through uh, quest and lab corp. They both have portals um, where your uh, blood tests are there. Like your doctor doesn't have to approve it. Um, the results just go directly there. You can see them. Um, so if your doctor sends you to LabCorp request, you have access to your results anytime you want that way. At least That's the, good. Recent, That's great. A few months. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't done non-esterified fatty acids to any of my clients. I should probably start doing that. That would be interesting. Be I think curious. that, like you said, triglyceride to HDL is such a good, powerful ratio. That in connection with fasting insulin tells us a lot. And people can probably know, they can think, how many vegetable oils have I eaten over the course of my lifespan? There could be some in my fat, you know, and, and right. all this kind of stuff. I think people, people know what their fatty acid composition is based on what they're consuming, but I think it's so important to highlight to people how damaging these oils are and how insidious they are in our foods and how we're often told that they're good for us based on really bad information and how they're yeah. just totally screwing up our metabolism and like you said, our satiety and fat loss. And probably really, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think these are some of the main culprits in insulin resistance. And I do not believe that carbohydrates in and of themselves are harmful to humans. Now, I'll qualify that statement as I do in the book by saying that processed carbohydrates are good for no one and that grain-based carbohydrates are probably not good for anyone. But there are many cultures throughout the world who eat carbohydrates and, and de demonstrate really pretty, pretty good metabolic health. So... I struggle with arguments that carbohydrates in and of themselves are bad. Um, and I think we should be very nuanced in those discussions. And I love that you pointed this out earlier that in the setting of a broken metabolism, carbohydrates might look worse uh, because you have trouble regulating your response to them in general, but they are probably not the cause of things. Uh, generally speaking, the removal of them can be very helpful for people in some situations, but I think it's more the quality we have a saying when it comes to like the, the way cows are raised, you know, it's not the cow, it's the how. And I think we should have another, another fancy one for carbohydrates. Like, you know, it's not, it's not, the carbohydrates are not bad. It's, it's, the, it's the quality of the carbohydrates that affects us probably in the biggest way. But I think that some people can use them if they, if they choose to and, and leverage that in a very healthy manner. If, but we have to really be pretty militant about our avoidance of these vegetable oils, I think. Yes, exactly. So that's why I call it public enemy number one. And yeah. um, I, uh, you know, I, when I first wrote Deep Nutrition, I was kind of on the fence about both of them because I personally struggled with sugar addiction. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, that was really, you know, powerful when I got over it, but I couldn't have gotten it over, over it. I could not have gotten over it without getting rid of the polyunsaturated fatty acids and the high vegetable oil stuff. I just wanted to say one thing real quick about like, I didn't mean to be flip and glib about like the media and HDL and stuff. The, the fact is we did not have the technology to measure um, non-esterified fatty acids in human blood back the 50, 60 years ago when they mm. were measuring HDL and LDL, they could do that. Um, and so that's why that's what we still measure because that's what was talked about. And we try to look at these numbers. We try to analyze them and the statisticians just, you know, take their supercomputers and try to find any kind of correlation. And they sometimes do, uh, but you know, with the LDL, but you know, really we shouldn't even be paying attention to that. What really matters, I think is if we had this non-esterified fatty acid test back in 1950, then, and we had an honest doctor, not Ansel Keys, um, in charge of all the research, getting all the government money, um, then we would have heard the truth a long, long time ago. They were almost there back in 1939. This didn't make it into deep nutrition because it was way too geeky, but there was this, um, they correlated, all they had were centrifuges back in the thirties to figure out what stuff was made out of. So they took biopsies from people who had plaque and had died from a heart attack and they centrifuged it and they made up like these, the centrifuge spins things really fast. And so the less dense stuff goes to the top and the more dense stuff goes to the bottom and they layered it out. And there was this one fraction 
that was like SF 20 to 40 or something like that. Cause it was very not dense. It was like one of the least dense ones on the very top. That was the one that correlated the most with dying from a heart attack at that mm. point time. And what is that triglyceride? That's it's pure fat. So it's, there's no cholesterol in there. So we, we had the data that said cholesterol doesn't correlate with dying from a heart attack. We had that. But Ansel Keys screwed everything up and, you know, people let him off the hook and say, well, he meant well and he was misguided. No, he was evil beyond words <laughs> because he had the data that showed that cigarette smoking caused heart attacks. He did the research to some of the seminal research to show that was quoted later um, but about cigarettes uh, cause heart attacks. He did the research and he, in his Time Magazine interview in 1961 said, well, I don't think it's cigarettes. A lot of people are saying that, but they don't know. They're not studying fats, and I think it's fats. You can take a look at the 1961 full text. <laughs> That's it. what he says. He downplays the research. Revisionist history. And just so people understand, <laughs> cholesterol is a steroid molecule. So in, in, in my book, I, I highlight, I show a picture of cholesterol. And you know, cholesterol is a steroid molecule, meaning it's multiple ring structures. Again, we're getting into some geeky organic chemistry, but the terminology is nuanced here. Triglycerides are kind of like, they're like phospholipids in a way with three tails. They have, a, they have a glycerol backbone and they have three fatty acids hanging down from them. That's a triglyceride. So it's three fats and a glycerol backbone. And if those three fats are composed, any of those three fats can be an unsaturated fatty acid. And that's probably why, you know, we're seeing a correlation between triglycerides potentially and heart disease. But also we know that serum triglycerides rise in the setting of insulin resistance. They're a pretty darn sensitive marker for, for um, metabolic dysfunction. Generally speaking, there's some nuance there as well, but generally speaking, that triglyceride to HDL ratio is king in my book. And it's such an interesting piece of it. Let's just touch on omega-3s briefly and then, then we'll wrap it up. So I just want to offer my opinion, then I'll get your opinion here. I think that omega-3s have been just touted as amazing. And I just can't always wrap my head around the chemistry. And, and we've kind of danced around this. I think that it's probably very valuable for humans to eat fish. Um, but I don't think we need to eat massive amounts of omega-3. And I think that most of the data, from my perspective, that shows that omega-3s are valuable has to do with the ratio between omega-3 and omega-6. And if the omega-6 is super high, if the linoleic acid in our diet is enriched, if it's too much, then yeah, we might need more omega-3. But if we're going to decrease the omega-6 in the first place, I don't think we need mega doses of omega-3 to be optimal humans. And from an organic chemistry perspective, that makes sense to me because regardless of whether it's a polyunsaturated fatty acid that has the first double bond, six carbons from the end or three carbons from the end, they're all going to oxidize. And I fear that mega dosing with omega-3 could lead to higher levels of oxidation in our cells higher levels of oxidized LDL, higher levels of LP little a, higher levels of this, these same sorts of things. But I just want people to know that we need some omega-3, but I am not a fan of mega dosing of that. What do you think about this controversial topic? I think you just quoted from a study that you haven't read yet because you predicted the science. Um, there's a doctor at the NIH named Chris Ramston who's done some amazing work in this area. And he actually did a study where what he did was remove um, the omega-6 and check what happens to people's omega-3 levels. And exactly as you predicted, um, because you can do that when you understand science, you can't do it when you're talking about statistics, you can't predict very well, but when you're talking about science, you can predict things. Um, it, what they went up by like two or three times without wow. increasing the dietary consumption of omega-3, just cutting out the, cutting down, cutting back on the omega-6 significantly. Mm. This was done in the context of a migraine study, and the, incidentally, um, the migraines uh, were extremely severe. People were on five medications a day to treat their migraines, and by the end of the 12-week study, everybody had such improvement, and 80% of them were off medicines entirely. And the improvements were accelerating at the end of the 12-week study. So if you, you could extend that thought as a thought experiment and predict that if people were off it for longer, they could be practically migraine-free. That's amazing. And did he measure the omega-3 and omega-6 as non-esterified fatty acids in the blood? Or how was he measuring them? 
that's a good question. I don't remember that detail, but um, it, I would imagine it had to be like that. As yeah, he works with another doctor, Dr. Amir Taha, um, uh, in uh, California, and he basically measures the. I think what he does is he me measures total fatty acids in the blood. I can't honestly. I can't remember. I'm sorry. If it It'll was be interesting, I'll have to. Writer. I'll have to get that study from me and take yeah. a look at it. But I think that. <laughs> Yeah, the key is omega six. The key is not over no, not over consuming omega six, and not and that's an evolutionary thing. It's not complex. It's just if you are eating most of your fat from animals, which is where we would have gotten it. And again, you know, I'm I'm not staunchly dogmatically against carbohydrates, but I think we would have gotten the majority of our fat from animals. Wild animals don't have a lot of omega six floating around in their body. It's mostly mm -hmm. saturated. Right. And, and some yeah. and you know half mono and half saturated with a small amount of PUFA. So Super interesting stuff. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find your work? And then I have the last question for you today. Oh, cool. <laughs> so drkate.com is D-R-C-A-T-E.com. Mm -hmm. And also you can go to fatburnfix.com and test your fat burn because there's a PDF that I made downloadable to, uh, uh, to help people download and test their fat burn factor. So you'll get a score between zero and a hundred. And, and the way that you use that is it helps you determine what, what, how long to stay in the different parts of the plan that I have in the book, the fat burn fix. I love it. And there's a quiz in there. That's quite helpful as well. There's a graphic that I want to share from the book and that's in that PDF as well. So people who are watching on YouTube will see this, but this was one of the more striking graphics from the book. And I, I'd highlight so much of what we've been talking about. You can see that from 1909, to not to 2000. So this is from your book. You can see this, this gray line is obesity. It's rising to 30% of the population. And, and if we extended this graph in 2020, this would be up to 40% for obesity. And then you can see that what happens is that as obesity rates are rising, carbohydrate rates were going down and then carbohydrate rates have come up. Amount of consumption of carbohydrates come up a little bit, but nothing more than they were in 1909. So we're at the same amount of carbohydrates that we were eating in 1909, and yet our obesity rates are astronomically larger. But this dark black line that you depict here tells what is a pretty compelling story around vegetable oils. Obesity and vegetable oil consumption tracks linearly, and then vegetable oils just spike off the chart here, and obesity continues to rise. This chart, I think, paints a really strong indictment of what's going on with obesity, that it's probably not this carb line probably this vegetable oil line. And that so graphic is also in that downloadable thing you've got. Thanks. Uh, so I didn't put diabetes on there because it was just gonna, it was a weight loss book and I was, was going to make the thing too ugly, but diabetes perfectly parallels that line. Perfectly. The um, vegetable so oil another, line. Yes, it does. And it, and, and by the way, type two diabetes did not, it wasn't described before 1938. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe it didn't exist. Maybe we didn't know how to look for it, but um, I think it didn't exist. That's where I'm drawing the line in the sand. <laughs> it doesn't really exist in indigenous cultures. Right. <laughs> it doesn't exist. I mean, it's essentially unheard of in indigenous peoples. And so it probably didn't exist before 1938 till we started having the technology to make oils from vegetables. It's really hard to make oils from vegetable seeds. You can't get a lot of oil out of a rapeseed, normally speaking. And our ancestors would never have made oil out of uh, flax or corn or, you know, or soybean, like we would, how would we have done this? We're never going to make oil. You know, this is technology <laughs> to make these oils. We open this Pandora's box of cheap oils that are, you know, have a certain flavor and probably, you know, released the dragon. So the last question I always ask my guests is what is the most radical thing that you have done recently? And it's the time of coronavirus, so who knows if, if you're, I mean, but you know, what has been the most radical thing you've done recently? Um, I went on uh, Dr. Drew, uh, Drew um, uh, Pinsky, I don't know if you know who he is. Yeah, I do. Um, and uh, he's uh, got a, he's a great doctor. He's like a Hollywood darling doctor. He's talking about all kinds of subjects. Uh, he's got a TV show. He invited me on because I posted something about flattening the curve the way we're doing it. Um, I think is uh, we're overlooking some opportunities to do it in a safer way. And I said some things about, um, you know, we should be asking old folks if they even want to go to the hospital if they get sick. 
Um, and I got called out as like, oh my God, she wants to kill people over. She's in for the death camps. And so like, I knew that might happen. Um, but I still did it anyway, because I think, you know, this it, it, is an opportunity to be ma more mature than we are in this country about yeah. death. And we are so afraid of it that we are afraid to even ask our elders if they are tired of fighting it. <laughs> And a lot of them are, and you know, I've worked in nursing homes and I've been in intensive care units when we had these, have these conversations about, do we want to revive? Do we want to put somebody on a ventilator? And in this country, now's a good time. If you haven't had that conversation with your parents and grandparents, because they're probably afraid to bring it up because a lot of times, uh, folks feel like they want to hang on for their family, right? They, they're like, well, they, you know, I, I if I say no, I don't want to be intubated. Now's my time. It's kind of like I'm rejecting my family. Right. Right. Like, I, I, I'm okay with dying. If you say that, it's kind of like you're rejecting your family, uh, you know, and not everybody can say it in the right way. Not everybody has the right emotions around this to say, look, you guys have made my life worth living. And if I go now, if now's my time, I'm happy with it. That's okay. Let someone else have that intensive care, that, that ventilator. Let a 30-year-old have it, please, because I don't even want it. Forget this stupid epidemic. I don't even want it ever, right? So now is a good time to, to try to have those conversations in an open and accepting way. Um, and just be aware that um, it is a radical thing to do, to even talk about. And people in your family will say all kinds of stuff, but it's the right thing to do. I love it. And I've thought the same things. I have always been fascinated with death and found thinking of death to be very clarifying in my own life. I think through my own adventures, you know, both spiritual and physical, I've been in situations that were dangerous and kind of had to think like, what if I fall off this mountain and die? And am I okay with that? And, you know, hopefully, you know, it's not my time to go now. But I think that facing our own death and not talking about something like death is a bad thing. It should, death should not be taboo. This is a great time to talk about death. And I think a lot of the response to coronavirus is, is fueled by fear of death within our culture and the inability of physicians and, and all of us really to, or the, the difficulty that we all face in talking about death in a sober way and thinking, you know, like we're all going to die at some point and maybe it's coronavirus that's going to kill us all. And maybe that's okay. And maybe we don't fight it. And, and how does it all look? But I think we are, I fear that we are acting in extreme ways as a society now out of fear of death or politicizing, yes. you know, death in a certain way and not, not accepting the fact that sometimes it happens. It's politicized. And the mandate, the unspoken mandate is that if you are okay with dying, you know, at the end of your life, um, approaching the end of your life or what you feel like is the end of your life. Maybe you're 60, but you have all these other medical problems and you're like, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I can do this much longer. Maybe you're 90 and you've had a great life and you're like, I don't know. I'm kind of tired. Um, you know, that should be okay. But we have this mandate now. It's like we have this mandate to fight death and we force people to fight it, even if they're not interested in that battle. And I think that is crazy. And that more than anything else is what's taking our economy down right now. I think so. I think so. And I think that, you know, there are lots of religious traditions and spiritual traditions that treat death as just another phase of life. It's another door that you walk through. It's not the end or who knows where, what happens after we die, but it's a very clarifying thing to think about. I don't think it's something we have to fear. I think it can be beautiful to understand our death and to embrace our death. And I think that if we fear it and we fight it, it's not, that's not the way it's supposed to be either. I mean, certainly we don't, you know, if someone is depressed, you know, we don't want someone, you know, committing suicide if they're depressed or in an unhealthy state. But if people, if people have come to the end of their life and lived fully and are in a good state of mind and are happy and not depressed and can say, you know what, it's my time to go, that's their right. And that can be beautiful. And that's amazing. Yes. I mean, the whole family is kind of let off the hook in a way when that sort of thing happens because they're like, great. 
you know, we didn't want to bring it up. We didn't want to say this, but it seemed like you were tired, you know? And the other person is like, well, I didn't bring it up. I want to bring it up. I didn't want to say it because it would make you guys feel like I don't want to be around you anymore. But if in, in this, it comes up in palliative care a lot, right? Or, or hospice situations where you have a third party bringing it up for the family and it's a relief. And that's where that beautiful thing happens when you find out everybody is on the same page. And that in and of itself is a beautiful thing. And I love it. That's super radical. And we don't get into that kind of stuff a whole lot on this podcast. So thanks for adding that. It was like super geeky. And we're talking about polyunsaturated fatty acids and electron clouds. And now we're talking about death and, and spirituality and what happens after we die. So that's just fantastic. So, and that's why I went into medicine. That's amazing. That because, <laughs> right. Because it's, it, we get to talk about electrophiles and <laughs> you know, lipid peroxides and what happens when we die. And that's, that's right. fascinating. And ultimately it's just about living well. And then, you know, at, at some day saying this is my last day and, and moving on and, and getting as much as you can before then. So that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and having such sobering conversation about coronavirus. I hope this has been helpful for people. And I really think it was awesome the way that, that we were able to sort of put a different spin on this and clarify some of these things and hopefully dispel some of the fear that might be out there and really help people understand some of these underlying factors that might be contributing to um, the, the fear that we're having now and, and hopefully empowering people a little bit to understand that we, we probably have more control over our body's response to these infections than we are being led to believe. So awesome. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. All right. Thank you to Dr. Kate Shanahan for coming on the podcast. Please check out her book, The Fat Burn Fix, is well worth your time. Dr. Kate is brilliant and a gem within this community, and I really enjoyed having her on. Please check out her work. I think you will find it to be very valuable. Please check out my book, The Carnivore Code, thecarnivorecodebook.com. It's live on Amazon, ebook, and print. And guess what? Coming in August, it is going to be much more widely distributed all over the world through my amazing new publisher, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. It will always be on sale, but in August we will release the new version, which will have an index for those of you who are interested. Um, until then, ebook and print are on Amazon. Thank you for your support. Please let me know what you think. Please leave me a review on Amazon if you like the book. Please leave this podcast a review on iTunes if you like this podcast. If fundamental health is your jam, do a steak dance, send it to me, and leave me a review on iTunes. Uh, what is going on with me? Well, I am uh, preparing the cookbook. So we are writing the Carnivore Code cookbook right now, which will be out later this year. We are making great efforts to have all sorts of creative recipes that are nose to tail and carnivore-ish. In the cookbook, I wanted to allow those of you who want to do a tier one carnivore diet, as I discuss in my book, to think about ways in which you might do this with the least toxic plants. So I'm working really hard to develop a spectrum of plant toxicity as best I can and create recipes which have more than animal products. There's going to be plenty of nose to tail recipes, but there's also going to be carnivore-ish stuff in there with the least toxic plants. If you've read the carnivore code, you will know which plants I think are the least toxic. So that is exciting news coming in the fall. I am also busily, busily, busily at work on some other exciting projects, which I will share with you all soon. Got some great podcast guests coming up. I'm going to have Tommy Wood back on the podcast next week for a special podcast. We're going to hear from who I believe is one of the smartest men in my tribe, uh, if not the smartest man I've ever met, a uh, pretty smart dude, about his views on coronavirus. We're going to rap about all that stuff. We're going to rap about vaccines and usefulness and herd immunology, herd immunity, all that kind of stuff next week. So check out that one with Tommy Wood coming next week. There's one beach in California open, uh, and I'm going there to surf and get in the ocean and being in nature as much as I can. And I am hoping that um, we will all be able to get back to normal life in a safe and healthy and happy way soon. I hope you are all doing well. My heart goes out to any of you who may be negatively affected by coronavirus in your family or in yourselves. And I hope that the content I produce is valuable. So until next time, I appreciate you all. Stay radical. I love you all and appreciate your support. Be well, and I will see you very soon. Mm -hmm.